So it is now my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce a good friend and colleague, Dr. Russ Humphreys. Dr. Humphreys probably does not need any introduction to many of you. He is an internationally known researcher, writer, and speaker. Dr. Humphreys earned his PhD from LSU. After that, he went to work at General Electric Corporation for a number of years. And after that, he worked at Sandia National Laboratories for, again, for a number of years. He retired very early while still in his teens, about 20 years ago from Sandia National Laboratories and began full-time work as a researcher, writer, and speaker for a number of different creationary organizations. Uh, the only one that I will mention is he has been, he was a longtime board member and a stir currently still a member of the Creation Research Society. He has the distinct honor of being a fellow of the Creation Research Society also. Uh, Dr. Humphreys, with you press him, you know, what does he do for fun? He's gonna tell you, well, what I do for fun is I just, I just research. I think partial differential equations is cool. But I did discover that he does enjoy the outdoors and he does enjoy hiking. And while we were talking about this, I discovered that he bumped into two friends of mine who are also hikers. He was out hiking in the woods of Georgia one day and he heard this, you know, he's enjoying the beautiful weather and the birds singing in the quiet. And he bumped into a couple, I heard in the distance, there's some loud talking. He comes upon two hikers who are standing arguing. They're standing in this clearing and they're arguing. One says, hey, those are moose tracks. And the other says, no, those are antelope tracks. Moose, antelope. Ah, so Dr. Humphreys is surveying the scene and thinking, you know, this is not going to end well. And sure enough, about 45 seconds later, the train came through. <laughs> With that, I'm glad Dr. Humphreys laughed. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Russ. Throw up your PowerPoint and we're ready to roll. Okay, I'll hit share screen here. And share screen number two. And I'm ready to go. Okay. Uh, uh oh. Let's see. Maybe. Hmm. Ah, I didn't hit share. Okay. 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 There we go. Excellent. Now, let's see. I am screen sharing. Uh, Let's see. I'm not sure what they're seeing, Gary. Are you seeing? Uh, I'm seeing your secondary screen, but I don't see your presentation yet. Oh, let's see. Maybe I need to do this. No. There, there we it go. Is. All right. All right. Uh, thanks for that uh, 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 compliment there, Gary, about retiring in my teens from Sandia. <laughs> Uh, I was actually 59, it's a bit early to retire, but uh, most of you uh, uh, know everything you need to know about me now from Gary. Uh, a lot of you know uh, my, uh, my work in cosmology. Now my previous, let's see if I can move this. Okay, I'll move this over here. Now I can see my notes. Uh, my previous two cosmologies didn't take enough account of what God said that he did during the first four days of creation. In, in fact, that's uh, my problem with everybody's cosmology. Uh, everybody who's published, uh, every creationist who's published on cosmology has his own theory that he likes, and he doesn't particularly uh, go for anyone else's theory. And I think that's, that's actually kind of nice uh, because the more theories we have, the more likely we are to have one that's right. So uh, that's fine. So, um, but I'm uh, thinking that all of us have not paid enough attention to what God did and what he said he did in the first four days of creation. So the third cosmology I'm working on now tries to do that. 
So let's look at the very beginning of the first day of creation. And you should see a big black screen because uh, God hasn't started creating yet at this point. So then we have in the beginning, oh, there we go. God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, the heavens are space itself. They're not uh, the sun, moon, and stars because they get created on the fourth day. And the earth, uh, when was that? Just a, a brief touch on that. Uh, according to the Hebrew text of the Bible, if you add up all the chronologies, you get about 6,000 years, give or take a few hundred uh, ago. And uh, interestingly, uh, we have science that gives the same date. And a lot of science that gives sort of an upper limit of uh, less than a million years. And uh, some science that gives less than 10,000 years. And so, but we do have some science that uh, says 6,000 years also, give or take uh, several thousand years. Science is not that accurate. So, uh, and now here's uh, uh, the second part of Genesis chapter one, verse two. The earth was formless and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The deep, the waters. The Hebrew word elsewhere in uh, scripture, it's tehom, uh, means just a large body of water, uh, no dimensions uh, given, just a big body of water. And uh, we get, uh, if you can see my cursor, it's right now on waters. So we know that the deep is waters and that there's a face of the deep. There's a surface to the waters. So we can picture what the deep was. And here I'm just showing it, uh, even though uh, there's no light yet, darkness was on the face of the deep. I'm just showing a, uh, a ball of waters. Now I'll tell you why I think it was a bowl of waters. And it was a big bowl of water, uh, much bigger than the earth. Now, I deduce that from stuff I'm going to show you in a few slides from now. Uh, and bowl, uh, we get from darkness was on, and the Spirit of God was uh, hovering or uh, moving over or on the face of the deep. So, uh, over or upon uh, implies that gravity is working, that there's an up and a down. And gravity would pull the waters, especially a big body of waters, uh, into a spherical shape. And as a matter of fact, that's why planets and stars are spherical also. Uh, so it's a big ball of water. And I take it to be ordinary liquid water. Uh, there are other words for, you know, if it was plasma, like some people want. Uh, there's a good Hebrew word for plasma, uh, one of the words for fire, which is, uh, has a lot of plasma in it. Uh, it's not ice. It's not because uh, there's a Hebrew word for that. So I take it all through uh, this account that God is able to say wh exactly what he means. And... Uh, and I do take this account as being exactly what God wanted to have written down. <clears throat> now, all is darkness now. Oh, by the way, the earth was formless and featureless within the deep. We don't know. Uh, it may have just been a region of water uh, within the deep uh, that is later going to become the earth, or it may have been water plus other stuff uh, dissolved in it. Uh, I can't be sure about that. But it was formless and featureless, formless and void. Uh, and it was within the deep. So all is darkness, but now God will light up the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So 
so let's turn on the light. There it is. First, the light shone from all directions. And God saw that the light was good. He says in the fourth verse, the first part of the fourth verse, here's the second part of that verse. The light shone from one direction. God separated the light from the darkness. I can't uh, make any sense of the verse other than saying that he gathered the light together and uh, made uh, a source come from one direction. Now the source is not the sun, uh, which we had, we will have uh, being made on the fourth day of creation. Uh, the source is not the sun. And there is a clue in a psalm uh, as to what the source was. It's Psalm 104, verse 2. Uh, and that portion of that psalm uh, calls, uh, talks about uh, the first day of creation. And it says that God covered himself, covering thyself with light as with a cloak. So somehow he gathered all the light and wrapped himself in it. Okay, so for the first three days, he was the source of light, but that's all you need to mark off and define a day. You just need light coming from one direction and the big ball of water turning underneath the light. Uh, uh, rotates around and within one day it marks off evening and morning. So next uh, we have the next thing that he did, the next part of this verse. An expanse appeared at the center of the ball of waters. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, Genesis 1, 6. Now, this word expanse uh, is actually uh, been the subject of quite a bit of controversy for millennia. Uh, people have uh, boggled their minds over this word. It's, a, it's an unusual word. In fact, it's, it's odd. The Hebrew word uh, for expanse is rakia. And I'll talk about rakia in a moment, but the Septuagint Greek translators of the Bible translated that as stereoma. Now, stereos means something hard and firm and solid and strong. In Greek, it's not a stereo set, <laughs> uh, although stereo uh, audio uh, sets get their name from the fact that we're hearing sound in three dimensions. So. But stereoma means that which is hard, firm, solid, and strong, or the solid part, or firmness, or steadfastness. So then, uh, I'm going to put my cursor up here. I hope you can see it. Uh, the Latin translation of the Greek uh, translates it firmamentum. Uh, and, uh, that comes from the Latin word firmus, meaning firm, strong, or stout. Stout, And firmamentum means that which is firm and strong and stout. And then the King James translators just transliterated the word without uh, saying more. So that's where we get the King James firmament. Now, I like the word firmament, uh, but expanse. Uh, describes another aspect of the word rakia. So rakia itself means something that is spread out by hammering thin, uh, like in the case of uh, uh, in, in Numbers, there was a description of hammering thin copper sheets in, and spreading them out over the copper altar. Uh, and uh, a goldsmith is spoken of uh, in scripture as uh, hammering a, a sheet of gold very thin until it's foil and spreading it out. So I'm making spreading motions with my hands here. Uh, so it can mean a something spread out and by hammering thin. Now this this has uh, boggled the minds of uh, commentators through uh, the ages. Uh, they can't 
imagine how a, a sheet, a two-dimensional sheet with a third thin dimension uh, can possibly describe uh, the heavens. Uh, and yet uh, uh, later on, God calls the expanse heavens. Uh, but uh, I propose that they're just thinking in too few dimensions. Uh, that our space that we live in, though we can't perceive it, is a solid material that uh, gets part of the flavor of the word, something solid that's spread out, uh, and that it's thin in a dimension that we can't see, uh, a fourth spatial dimension. Now, time would be a fifth dimension in this way of looking at things but it's something thin and we're in it. And so we are thin in the fourth spatial dimension and we're just not built or equipped to ordinarily see that uh, extra dimension. So, uh, so it's something that our space, the space of the whole universe is something that's thin in a dimension we can't see or detect. And it's thick in the other three dimensions that we can see, and it's been spread out. I'm making my hands spread out here uh, by hammering uh, it thin. So now there's another thing about this verse. Notice in the midst of the waters. That's the Hebrew word betok, means just in the middle of something. Uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, Eve spoke to Satan, answered Satan's question, uh, uh, saying we shouldn't eat from the tree, the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Genesis 3.3. 3. And God had referred to the tree of life uh, in the midst of the garden, Genesis 2.8. So that Hebrew word, batok, uh, just means in the middle of. So let's see what that implies for the size of a big ball of water. The firmament started in the midst. Um, and uh, we have here, I'm gonna put my cursor here, waters above the firmament. We have the firmament down here near the center as a uh, small shell of stuff which seems empty to us, but is a stuff, a material. Uh, the, I call it the fabric of space sometimes, but it's a solid material. Uh, and then there are waters below the firm, firmament. <laughs> uh, and uh, so the waters below the firmament on the third day turned into the earth. God changed it. Uh, change that material, and I'll talk more about that in my second talk today. Um, um, I'm going to talk about the magnetic fields of the planets and the sun and the, and the stars uh, and of the earth. And uh, so I'll talk about a verse that pretty clearly says God changed the water into the solid material of the earth. So if the firmament uh, uh, is going below, if the waters below the firmament are going to turn into uh, are going to turn into uh, uh, something solid, uh, then the waters below were about the same size as the Earth is now. So it has a radius now of six thousand kilometers. But this is down in the midst of the waters. So the waters, their face, the face of the deep, the surface of the deep must be out much at a radius much greater than 6,000 kilometers. Okay, the firmament did not stay this small size. It expanded greatly. And I'm gonna run a little animation, so keep your eye on the screen. Uh, there's the ball of waters with a firmament small within it, and now it's going to expand. None of this is to scale because 
it's big enough to contain all the stars that we now can detect with our Hubble Space Telescope by the fourth day. And just to make sure that uh, we know that what God means by the firmament or the expanse, God called the firmament heavens in Genesis 1.6. And actually if repeats that phrase, the expanse of the heavens or the firmament of the heavens three times in this one chapter. Uh, so he's making a point there. The, the heavens are everything that's above the earth. And he called it heavens. So the waters above moved outward. I'm going to put my cursor on the waters above there. And uh, they had to move outward more than 14 billion light years above us. Now, a light year is 6 trillion miles. It's a unit of distance, not time. Now, uh, I need a little more confirmation of this uh, view, which many people might find surprising. So take a look at Psalm 148, verse 4. It says that waters are above the highest stars. There's the psalm. Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. So you notice down at the bottom, I've got the dimensions of the waters above, uh, greater than 24 billion light years. And where do I get that figure? Because the uh, Hubble Space Telescope and other big uh, ways of looking at the heavens we have indicate that the, uh, the galaxies and stars go out at least 24 billion light years. They probably go out further. Now, if uh, we can eventually see out to where the waters are now, uh, we wouldn't see much. We would just see a place where the galaxies no longer were, and it would be black uh, because this, uh, the waters above would be very thin by now, by this, this point, because they were spread over such a large area. So uh, they would be ice particles and maybe planets uh, of ice on the top and interiors of water. Uh, because it's cold out there, but the scripture does call them still. At this time, the psalm was written after, uh, after the Genesis flood, for example, the waters, not the ice. So the waters are above the heavens, but it's spread very thin in particles and, and small planets, let's say. So this psalm, as I mentioned, it was written after the Genesis flood. So it's not talking about a vapor canopy that would have collapsed during the flood. Some of you uh, still uh, may be thinking in terms of that early creationist theory called the, the canopy theory. But this isn't the canopy, or it, you could say maybe I've moved the canopy way out <laughs> above uh, everything, and it's so far away that it couldn't possibly collapse uh, upon the earth. So. Whatever, uh, whatever formed the windows of the heavens uh, during the Genesis flood, it was something different than this. So now I'm going to show you a graph. Let's graph the action. Now, I'm going to walk you through this graph. The firmament, its point is that the firmament expanded very fast. So here, if you can see my cursor, it's over at the bottom left. Uh, this point right here is 6,000 kilometers. But then things get much bigger. And this point around here is one millionth of a light year. That's still pretty far out there. This is one light year where I've put the face of the deep. Uh, it may have been two or three instead of one. But this is just a conceptual diagram. Uh, out here is one million light years. And out here is 10 billion light years. So this bottom axis is a very compressed scale. It's distance from Earth in light years. Now the vertical axis is time. 
time on Earth, as measured right here on Earth. Zero here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, to the fifth day. And so we have the deep existing until God separated it uh, here. And then along this line here, the waters below continue to exist for uh, three days till the start of day three. And then God said, let the dry land appear and let the seas appear. So uh, he changed uh, the earth here on the third day of creation. Now I want to show what happened to the deep. I'm going to expand the deep and uh, move the waters above the expanse out, way out, way out here, uh, 10 billion light years away. So this is just a conceptual scale. I'm sure things would look a little different. Uh, the actual things would have looked a little different. So keep your eye on the screen. There's the expanse of expanding and the waters above the expanse. And they have moved way out here by the fourth day. So these lines, like I say, were probably curved, uh, but I'm just drawing sort of a conceptual schematic of their expansion. And you notice they're getting thinner and thinner as you go out until we're way out here at 10 billion light years. And uh, let's see. So the big thing I want you to see from this <clears throat> is that he moved those waters out there very fast, and he expanded the expanse very fast. Uh, uh, within just a few days, as measured by clocks here on Earth, he got those waters out there 10 billion light years, or let's see, 6 trillion times 10 billion miles. <laughs> a long way. And if you calculate, uh, the speed as measured by clocks here on Earth, it would have been trillions of times what the speed of light is here. Now the speed of light has to be normal on Earth, uh, what it is now, because the speed of light and the speed of time are connected. I'll repeat that several times during this talk. If you have uh, uh, time going ordinarily, then the speed of light is going to be ordinary. Uh, and we know that time was ordinary because of verses like Exodus 20, 11, for in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth. Uh, so, and the context of that verse is ordinary days of the week, both before and after it, the same word is used for an ordinary day of the week, ordinary length. So the time on Earth was just proceeding as it does today, and the speed of light on Earth was what it is today. But out here in the heavens, we have uh, the waters above moving out very fast. And the expanse itself, which I mentioned to you, is a solid, the firmament. Uh, and it has moved out very fast. So if uh, God was going to keep his laws of physics pretty much the way they are now, the simplest way to do that is to increase the speed of light uh, up to a trillion times faster than it is today. So the speed of light out here in the heavens would be fast, whereas light would be at its ordinary speed here on Earth. So uh, now, why would God do that? This is a, you know, why, why not just start with the waters already way out there if he wanted waters above the heavens? Uh, why not just make the heavens, make the waters out there to begin with? So I have a theory. I don't know why he did this. He didn't say uh, why he chose this way, but I have a theory. My theory is that balls of water stayed behind. You see these little balls as the expanse expanded. I'll run that expansion again. And there's the waters above. 
and I like the balls of water being there because he would turn them into planets and stars, according to my theory about the origins of the magnetic fields of the planets and stars. So my next talk today, uh, which will be uh, roughly an hour and a half from now, uh, I think you can you can explain that, Gary, when when my next talk will be. Uh, it will be about that theory of the origin of magnetic fields. But this, uh, this particular thought explains uh, why I think he expanded the firmament. So, now there would be enough water to make all the stars that we can see out there with the Hubble Space Telescope. There would be enough water uh, the same mass of water would be in the deep if it was originally uh, a few light years in diameter. So that's why I picked the starting size as a few light years. So now let's get back to the light from the stars. Oh, by the way, on the fourth day, the balls became stars and planets. So here's another graph. It's the same kind of graph. The bottom scale is the same, uh, 6,000 years here, one light year here, 10 billion light years way out here. But I've expanded the time scale and just grabbed a piece of it. Here's the beginning of the fourth day. Here's the beginning of the fifth day. And here are the waters above arriving at their position at 10 billion light years out here. Uh, at the very beginning of the fourth day. Now, I'm going to give you a plot of the light rays that proceeded out from those balls of water that he's turned into stars uh, out here. I'm going to plot them as uh, straight lines moving in toward the Earth. So here's an animation of it. So. And this light has to move very fast because the waters above and the expanse expanded very fast. So this light is coming in uh, at trillions of times the speed of light on Earth and, and today out in space. So now you see this red line along here. That's where God slows down light throughout the heavens in an instant. There has to be some point at which uh, the light slows down and becomes the ordinary speed that we can uh, measure out there in the heavens uh, by various techniques. Uh, so uh, the speed of light out there in the heavens is now very large or very much smaller than it was. And, uh, and it has, this has to happen uh, before the end of the fourth day. So I'm picturing it as just all happening in an instant, and there is an advantage uh, to this. Now, uh, so this is the light slowdown. Now, uh, things are happening very fast here because, as I mentioned, the speed of light is the speed of time. So events are happening very fast here. Uh, and if the speed of light is trillions of times what it is today, you would have billions of years worth of events happening out here in the stars. So we could uh, imagine that each uh, light beam is a pulse uh, uh, of light that comes from something uh, once every year, say, <laughs> or once every second, whatever. Uh, those pulses would be very fast. Uh, compared to what they are today. And the light itself would have a higher frequency than it does today, much higher. So everything would be, all this light would be enormously blue shifted. It would be much bluer than uh, the light that we now see. But then this light all at one instant, as it's traveling, God slows down the light. So then I'm going to put the the paths of the light uh, after the slowdown. You see that. 
So this is the light that we're now seeing today. Some of this light uh, is light that uh, not only would be seen uh, at the end of the fourth day and by Adam and Eve, but some of these later beams would take 6,000 years to arrive to the earth. And we would be seeing light that had been in this region, had originated in this region uh, when time was fast. So because we're looking back through this window, uh, so to speak, this, this interface, uh, and looking back through it, we would be seeing events uh, at their normal rate, but we would be seeing uh, uh, things that had taken billions of years to develop. And uh, I'll get to why God would do things like that. But one advantage is that now all the light that's coming to us is not blue shifted anymore. It's normal, has the normal spectrum. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, the last thing to point out is that time is normal uh, out there in the heavens and here. But what we see in the distant heavens is stuff that happened uh, before the end of the fourth day. And it happened very, very fast, but it would look like billions of years worth of events had happened. The galaxies would have been spiraling for quite a while and, uh, and uh, they would develop their spiral arms, for example. Uh, and you know, all the events that we see out there in the heavens uh, would look like billions of years had elapsed, but actually only a day or so uh, would be the real time as measured by clocks here on Earth. Okay, this is a, I know it's a hard concept, but uh, hang in there. This is about the hardest uh, part uh, of this idea. So uh, why would God do it this way? He wanted starlight to get here fast. So uh, this is one, Genesis 1.15. He's talking about the sun, moon, and stars. And then, then he says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so, Genesis 1.15. So uh, he, uh, this is a way that the light can get here fast. And it's just put together from the clues that we have right there in Genesis 1 about the waters from the heavens, uh, the waters above the heavens getting out there so rapidly. Now, why did he want to get the light here fast? He wanted us to see his glory and his handiwork. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. So he wanted us to be able to see uh, marvelous, wonderful things happening out there. And it takes uh, things that are, so, that are so big, take millions and billions of years to really develop. And uh, so uh, he is letting us see uh, all his physical laws happening. For example, colliding black holes and generating gravitational waves that we can detect here on the Earth. Uh, uh, that would have happened a billion years ago uh, for the one event that, that I'm thinking of. Uh, so, uh, but it's uh, really only 6,000 years ago as measured by clocks here on Earth. Okay, uh, on one last thing to say. Uh, the heavens really are just a showpiece. Uh, they are not as important, apparently, to God as the earth and the people on it. Uh, because uh, later on uh, in that period of time of great trouble on the earth that uh, some people call the Great Tribulation Period, seven years long, uh, partway through that period, he is going to shut down the stars. They're going to fall and uh, be gone. And so, uh, uh, you know, and yet he lets the earth and the sun and the moon continue. Uh, 
and uh, the earth and, and sun and moon will continue maybe through the thousand years. Maybe he doesn't make new stars for the millennial kingdom. Now, some of you uh, are not uh, into that view of prophecy, so just you know, throw away what I've said and don't worry about it. Uh, but my point is that uh, the heavens are there to show his glory, but uh, they're also there to show uh, his power in judgment uh, by shutting them down. So, okay, I'm finished, Gary. Thank you for your attention, folks. I appreciate it. Maybe we'll have some questions that will clarify all this. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Humphreys. I don't know if you can hear the thunderous applause, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, can I just key off one thing uh, Russ said? He said, this is hard to understand. <laughs> I've heard this a couple times, and you really have to stop and think about it. Uh, folks, don't think this is something that's just, oh, yeah, I heard him talk about it. I got it right now. Uh, but God gave us a mind and reason, and this is a great thing to grapple with. So, Russ, if you're up to it, I mentioned before that folks could put questions in chat. For those of you that know, there is a Q&A section also in Blackboard, um, Blackboard, <laughs> in Zoom here. So if you have a question and can do the Q&A, um, I'll start with a couple there. If you can't find that and wanna do chat, we'll see how many we can get to, or if we just go take a break, okay? So Dr. Humphreys, this is from Dr. Kevin Voss, uh, talking in a secular perspective. From a scientific point of view, how can it be explained that the extreme distance found in the universe, let's say 22 billion light years, exceeds the age of the universe thought to be about 14 billion years? He must have asked that question uh, before I started to talk. Yeah, and I think also it might have a little bit Because to my do. talk is all about that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I think it might also be from a secular standpoint. So, um, I guess take a look at my talk again. Okay. I hope Gary gets it okay. recorded or yes. you can see it again <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is that God uh, uh, had much faster light during the first four days of creation above the earth, while at the same time having ordinary speed light uh, right here on the earth. So. Okay, yep. let's okay. go to the next. Let's get another, another question. <laughs> Why do you believe the expanding of the expanse stopped on day four? Could it still be expanding as some scientists believe the universe is doing? Or would that mean the speed of light and time would still be accelerating as well? The answer is that it could be expanding. I just, uh, I stopped it, uh, but I don't know that it stopped. Uh, and so, but the speed of light uh, out there, uh, I'm pretty confident is what it is here today. So, uh, so the expansion though uh, could continue and that could account for the red shifts or those balls of water that turned into stars uh, could have been left with some uh, residual motion moving outward and more moving faster outward when they're farther away, and that might make the red shift. So there's lots of different possible causes for the uh, slight red shift that we see of distant objects. So I guess that's about all I can say on that one. Okay, great. Next question. Is the expansion describing an expansion in space or an expansion of space? Yes. <laughs> there are, there are uh, two heavens that are being spoken of here. First, uh, there is that space or heavens uh, that was above the ball of water, even at the beginning, just an empty space, but a space pretty much like the space we have today. Uh, but then within that space, he creates another space, which he calls the expanse, the firmament, and he calls that heavens also. So there's uh, in that firmament space, which is the one we're in, uh, expanded rapidly. 
So great. Could the universe be in the process of collapsing at present and we just don't know it yet? Well, we see no sign of it. Uh, in uh, yes, uh, it might it might have collapsed or gone out of ex existence, uh, and and we don't see uh, the universe as it is today. We see the universe uh, mostly as it was uh, during day four, uh, with uh, billions of light, billions of years worth of events having elapsed out there. So we don't, you know, I can't say, but the, uh, God doesn't say uh, that the universe is collapsing and the, the end that he describes uh, for uh, this heavens and the earth in the future doesn't sound like a collapse. So I would say biblically, uh, we, we can be pretty confident that it's not collapsing. Good. How do we reconcile the idea of creation from nothing with the deep, which seems to be pre-existing? Well, uh, one thing in the book of Hebrews, uh, it says that he created that which we see out of that which is unseen. And the deep is seen, so, uh, so it looks like he created uh, the deep right there at the beginning, and uh, that's included in the very first line of Genesis. And he doesn't mention the deep until uh, after the first line of Genesis. So I would say that uh, the creation was first of that ball of water and of whatever the earth was within the ball of water, plus the space in which the, the ball of water existed, the heavens. So. I don't, I don't see that the, the uh, water was pre-existent at all. Okay. Uh, we, I want to circle back to that first question again. Um, it, a secular scientist, a naturalist would say the universe is approximately 24 billion light years in diameter. How do you reconcile that with an age of 14 billion years? I think this is a question about expansion of the Big Bang. Oh, with an age of 14 billion years? Yes. Well, oh, you mean why, how, how did they? How did they arrive at that? How did they arrive at yes. that? Well, basically they say that uh, uh, space, their space in, in their picture, one of, the, one of the Big Bang pictures is of uh, our space and our universe as being the surface of a sphere that's expanding in four dimensions. So by the way, that fourth dimension that I mentioned is part of uh, actually uh, the uh, general theory of relativity of Einstein. And uh, so anyhow, that sphere can expand outward and into a four dimensional space, which I'll call hyperspace. And uh, the uh, the speed and the speed limit in hyperspace doesn't seem to be this, as low as the speed of light. Uh, if uh, if the Big Bang is right, uh, which I don't think is right, but uh, anyhow, it can it can move outward uh, uh, very rapidly. Now that means the stretching of the space uh, on the balloon uh, can if you get far enough away, can be greater than the speed of light, but actually it's just the space itself uh, that's moving uh, greater than the speed of light. Light on the surface of that balloon, uh, or hyperspace balloon, by the way, don't let you, yourself think that we're in the balloon or uh, we're part of the balloon. Uh, so, uh, uh, anyhow, light waves can only move at the speed of light along that surface. So there's a point where we wouldn't, we wouldn't be seeing any more light. It would be, by the way, very redshifted, infinitely redshifted out at a certain point. All of this is uh, nice science fiction, I think. 
<laughs> so, but that's how they reconcile it. <laughs> okay, excellent. By the way, you should know that you have a number of people commending you. For example, praise God that Dr. Humphreys has given this insight. Okay, some more questions. What does it mean for the firmament to be solid? Isn't the firm connotation? I just lost you. <laughs> I just the... lost you, Gary. Oh, really? Can yeah. you can you hear me now? Uh, the last word I heard was, "What does it mean for the firmament?" Okay. What does it mean for the firmament to be solid? Isn't the firm connotation of the word a carryover from the Greek translators regarding a specific cosmology? Blah blah blah. What does it mean for the firmament to be solid? It means it was solid. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes, it's not a carryover from the Greek. It's a carryover from uh, the Hebrew, rakia, something solid that is hammered thin and spread out in its other two dimensions or other three dimensions. Uh, so it's, it's something that's a, a material. And uh, the general theory of relativity speaks of space as being some kind of solid material that can be deformed and can be bent and uh, it requires a, at least one extra direction for it to be bent in. So uh, there, you know, uh, what I'm saying the rakia was is not too different than what general relativity is saying space is. We have a lot of other indications from science that space is a material that if we can't detect it. Uh, we move through it, it moves through us. Um, and there's uh, a physics way that can happen. Uh, it would that not be perceptible to us, but uh, nonetheless, it's a solid material that can be deformed and can be spread out uh, according to, well, uh, I don't know how many of you out there are electrical engineers, but if you've ever heard of Maxwell's displacement current uh, and the experiments pointing to that, that uh, points to uh, the vacuum not being empty, but being filled with a stuff, uh, a material. And so uh, there are other experiments in physics that have been done. Uh, you've heard of the quantum vacuum. That's really a vacuum that's completely filled with particles. Uh, we can't detect those particles, but, uh, and it's very massive, very dense. Uh, and yet we don't detect those particles. But the whole theory of quantum electrodynamics is based on the assumption uh, that the vacuum or space or the heavens are filled with some kind of particles. Could gravity be the way God slowed down light since water can form a ball with just surface tension? Gravity would be involved. Uh, but not surface tension. Uh, well, okay, if it has, if the ball certainly had surface tension and there certainly was gravity and it probably was a very strong gravity out there at the surface of the deep when it started out. So uh, gravitation is definitely involved. And um, I don't know how though, I, I've uh, just, um, barely scratched the surface of whatever science behind what God did. Uh, I, I'm just uh, doing more head scratching than any, anything else. But uh, since we know from uh, experiment and from general relativity that gravity does affect the speed of light, uh, certainly it could have been involved. Do you have verses that indicate the earth is at the center of the universe? Just that one verse uh, in the midst, you remember uh, in the midst of a ball of water uh, was this small region which he turned to the solid earth. And then he expanded everything out from that. Um, I don't know exactly whether uh, uh, we are exactly at the center. I don't know if we are. Uh, there is scientific evidence uh, that uh, we are near, our galaxy at least, is uh, pretty much at the center of an arrangement of galaxies 
around it. Uh, so, uh, but the only scripture I can think of right now uh, is the is that one in the midst. Great. In the middle of, in the center of. So. Where can we find copies of your papers? Oh, well, you, uh, you can't find a copy of a paper on this one yet because I'm not going to write anything until I get a better idea of uh, the science behind it. Uh, I am confident of the scriptures, uh, that just taking scriptures straightforwardly will do this, but no, I don't have any, this third cosmology, I don't have. My second cosmology you can find in the Journal of Creation. If you go to creation.com, uh, you'll find uh, that in one of the journals. I believe it was in the year 2008. Um, and that is in, so if you just look by my name uh, through the archived uh, Journal of Creation for the year 2008, it may have been um, the third issue of the year or, or the second issue, I can't remember which, uh, but that's my second cosmology. My first cosmology is a book I wrote in 1984, uh, 1994, uh, called Starlight and Time. And uh, Carl Wieland in Australia uh, helped me write the book. He didn't want to be listed as a co-author, but I think he deserves to be thought of as a co-author. It's a very readable book. That's my first cosmology. So, but as for my third cosmology, I think that when I get the science understood um, behind what God said he did, um, if, I, if he ever permits me to see that, uh, that it will probably incorporate pieces of the first cosmology and the second cosmology. So. Great. In addition to going to creation.com and searching for Dr. Humphreys, you can also go to creationresearch.org and search for him and find a number of other articles. Next question. Does this view take into account the relative position of the Earth in the Milky Way and the galaxy's position in the universe? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Jump over here. Yes, that's the answer. Uh, why do we talk about the universe being flat as opposed to having curvature? Why do I talk about it or? I don't know if this is secular scientists. This is why do we talk about the universe being flat as opposed to having curvature? Oh, uh, well, in the Big Bang, uh, there are several versions of the you know, one is the hyperspace balloon I talked about. Another is like just a flat sheet. And another is a, a sort of saddle shaped uh, sheet. Uh, uh, there are those three versions of it. Uh, and the Big Bang people think because of their inflationary cosmology, they want uh, the universe to be flat. So they imagine that there's a whole lot more matter out there in the universe to make it flat. Uh, uh, so, but you need uh, a lot more matter than we see. So the rest of the matter is called dark energy or dark matter. So, but that's again, nice science fiction. Yep. <laughs> the initial huge ball of water was said to be rotating. Is there evidence of overall angular momentum of the universe? Yes. Yes, there is. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's uh, stuff that's just come out. Uh, there, uh, and there are other things, but this recent paper describes uh, uh, that all the spins of all the galaxies that they took account of uh, tend to point in a couple of directions. Uh, so, uh, whether it's what, several directions or one direction, I don't know, the, but the galaxies are spinning and they, there's, so there's a net angular momentum, uh, maybe, of the whole cosmos. 
Should we no. expect, oh, I'm sorry, Russ, were you done? No, I'm finished. Okay. <laughs> Should we expect objects to look older with distance from Earth? Yes, um, because you're looking through that slow down interface that happened near the end of the fourth day, but you're looking back into uh, and out into a region where billions of years worth of events happened. So. Okay, we'll end with a simple one. Sorry, couldn't get to everybody's. What do you think is the real value of Omega? Ah, well, uh, there again, that's tied to a, a, a science fiction cosmology called the Big Bang. Um, I, I don't know whether Omega uh, has a value of one or not. Uh, if one was going to be, uh, be a Big Banger, it would be kind of nice to have it be one, uh, but it doesn't have to be. So. Uh, I don't know, uh, but maybe what uh, the person means is, uh, do I think there's a whole lot more matter out there in the universe uh, than, uh, than we can see? And uh, I think that there is a whole lot more energy in the fabric of space than the matter we can see, and that energy has gravitation produces gravitation. So that would make uh, the ratio. Uh, but then uh, the rest of the ratio has to do with how fast it's expanding. And I'm not sure it's expanding now or not. So, <laughs> so it's just, uh, it, it doesn't apply to my cosmology. So. Exactly. <laughs>